Hi all, welcome back again to 5WH. Uh, as always, it's me, Joe, a former security analyst, um, and all I want to do is bring you some global events that aren't COVID, Trump or Brexit related. Uh, as normal, the format will be some derivative of who, what, where, when, why and how, with the order mixed depending on the context of the event and what makes sense, uh, as I figure these questions are a really good handrail to stop me going off into the, uh, the back beyond, and also to give you all the key points to have some sort of understanding of what's going on. So I guess, as always, we'll start with the what. Uh, we'll be looking at the increase in terrorism and insurgent activity in the Cabo Delgado, turning what was once hoped to be a new centre of Mozambique's resource and extractions industry into a troubled region plagued by militants and government counterinsurgency efforts. Uh, at the moment, an estimated 10% of the region's 200,000 strong population are presently internally displaced, or in, you know, real words, refugees. Um, Neighbouring states have felt the region is sufficiently unpredictable that they have deployed troops to their border regions uh, and are also contemplating intervening more directly. The thing that drew my attention to this, I mean, I, I've, I've not paid particular attention to Mozambique recently, but uh, in my former role, I wrote a report on this incident when the attacks began to start in about 2017. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the situation has changed since that time. So I think we need to put a bit of context into the where for this one. Uh, Mozambique is a coastal nation on the southeast of the African landmass. The country is directly opposite the island of Madagascar and the Comoros Islands, and its borders, moving anti-clockwise from north to south, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Eswatini, uh, which was formerly known as Swaziland, uh, just to avoid confusion there. The capital of the country, uh, Maputo, is located in the far south of the country, close to the borders with South Africa and Eswatini. Uh, apologies for any pronunciation, as always. Uh, Cabo Delgado itself, the region uh, under question, uh, holds extensive natural gas and gemstone deposits, particularly rubies, and is in the far north of the country, uh, bordering primarily on Tanzania. So now we'll jump into the when. As always, there's there's more than one when we need to consider. Um, as I suggested in the start, the insurgency here is not particularly new. I, I wrote a piece on it about three years ago when it was emerging, for my former employer. Um, but it has jumped into the news like explicitly far more recently. So uh, the reason this has happened is over the intervening period of time, the insurgency has become more entrenched and better developed, uh, with the major insurgent group seizing a key strategic port over August, uh, fundamentally cutting off part of the region from the outside world. Uh, as of last week, the conflict was also brought to global attention following reports of a pregnant woman being shot 36 times by security forces following a beating. Uh, this is a tangible example of activities in the region that have been causing uh, alarm in human rights circles for a while, but this is a particularly, um, particularly egregious breach of any sort of law and order. Uh, these factors combined... Uh, illustrate that there's a more recent escalation which has fueled suggestions that other regional players may seek to involve in the region to impose stability um, and we'll be talking about those regional actors a little more in a second. So if we're going to look any further into the context here I think we need to have a bit of an understanding on who some of the key players are. So we'll start with uh, the insurgent group uh, known correctly as Alu Suna Waljama, the key banner of the Cabo Delgado insurgency uh, is that of Al-Shabaab. This roughly translates from Arabic into English as the youth, uh, and is likely used to suggest the group's opposition to the status quo and elders within its communities. They are functionally quite a revolutionary bunch. Um, it's worth noting that there are no known connections between this Al-Shabaab in Mozambique and the Al-Shabaab of significantly greater infamy in Somalia. Um, the group does, however, claim connections to the Islamic State, although this remains somewhat intangible and seems to mostly be a bit of um, an attempt to ideologically hang on the coats of IS's brand in an effort to boost its prestige and mystique among the population. Um, in real terms, we're looking at an organisation that began as a, uh, a rallying centre for local criminal groups, distressed and uh, sort of disenfranchised individuals, 
uh, although more recently it does appear to have taken on a more rigorously jihadist message. We've then got the the Mozambique government. Um, their aims, as far as anyone really can tell, is to impose stability on the region uh, as as best possible in order to you know allow life to go on and to make best use of the resources in the region. Uh, they have deployed, in addition to sort of uh, the local police forces, uh, their army to the region in an attempt to quell it. Uh, and we'll have a quick look at the army because understanding what the army's issues are will begin to perhaps illustrate why this problem isn't going away. So jumping back a few years, uh, the best records I can find from open source resources suggest that the Mozambique army consists of about 10,000 troops uh, with seven light infantry battalions, uh, two of combat engineers, two battalions of artillery, one logistics battalion, and three, and I'm using air quotes here, special forces, close close air quotes, battalions. Um, it's important, given the, the resources available to Mozambique, that we do not assume these special forces mean an analogue to, say, the SAS or the Navy SEALs. I think we need to look at it in a historical context here with Mozambique's involvement in local conflicts uh, during the Cold War and more recently, uh, particularly those with the Rhodesia and South Africa, and consider that these are probably premier light infantry and bush warfare specialists with a bit of a side gig going on in insurgency and counterinsurgency, um, just to put a lens on what that is. Um, exactly which units are deployed into Cabo Delgado remain somewhat unclear, but you can imagine that a unit with special forces in the title is likely to be the sort of group you'd put in to deal with an insurgency. As a whole, the forces are generally equipped with early to mid Cold War era Soviet equipment as a result of Mozambique's legacy as a, uh, in sort of proxy conflicts on the continent. Um, and given this, not only is the equipment pretty aged, uh, at again about 2016, an estimate, estimated only 10% of its vehicles, plants and equipment were actually serviceable. Uh, and this is despite donations of kit and training from China. Um, and significantly exacerbated by the fact that uh, Mozambique employs a system of selective conscription to fill out the ranks. So we're not really looking at a highly equipped or motivated force. Um, indeed, the lack of success in confrontation with the rebels goes a long way to demonstrate that their level of equipment, motivation, morale, and frankly, will to fight is limited at best. This lack of discipline is also likely to be a uh, key underpinning factor in the reported war crimes and abuses occurring in the region. Um, in addition to the conventional national forces, the president of Mozambique has also somewhat concerningly sought aid from Eric Prince, a Trump associate and the founder of a disgraced private military company known as Blackwater, which committed atrocities in Iraq in the mid 2000s. Um, and has since replaced the Eric Prince Associates with a group of roughly 170 Russian mercenaries um, associated with the Wagner Group. Uh, these guys have come into country with uh, equipment including unmanned aerial vehicles and at least one helicopter gunship, um, which is some fairly serious firepower when you're considering um, the level of equipment the actual Mozambique army has is significantly less than that. Um, what we need to consider here is that under Russian law, the organization of private military companies or private security firms in, in this type is illegal. Um, Wagner forces have been deployed to Libya uh, and regions in Syria and Donbass in Ukraine. And it's generally, um, generally seen as an analogue uh, in Russian foreign policy to the likes of the Condor Legion that Germany deployed during the Spanish Civil War, so we should be looking at this rather than um, simply the deployment of sort of corporate mercenaries or anything along those lines as an extension of Russian foreign policy. Um, exactly what they're seeking to achieve is, uh, frankly, it's likely commercial and access to the natural resources, but it it remains something to keep an eye on. Um, I haven't really managed to find a great deal out about the industry in the region, but it's worth considering that. Um, the violence in the region does seem to correlate, if not have a direct causal relationship, uh, with the, the violence and the development of business. So we should consider that there are going to be commercial and corporate 
undertones to this um with a lot of the extractives industry throughout africa the firms particularly multinationals that are bought in by governments to extract resources generally bring in foreign typically western experts in order to coordinate the extraction and this has in in multiple locations led to discontent among the local population who see the negative effects of the extraction of those materials impacting their communities their societies and their environment yet very very rarely actually see any tangible benefit from this extraction um and this in itself is likely a contributing factor to um well, frankly it motivates people to join the insurgency who may not have done on say purely religious grounds so the why and the how uh in these circumstances are somewhat interlinked so we'll cover them together uh, as i said above there's at least a correlation if not a direct causal link between the violence in the Cabo Delgado region and the expansion of the extractives industry in the area. Um, this in turn has an interplay into pre-existing smuggling and criminal activity. Um, the so-called Al-Shabaab group have cultural and linguistic links into the surrounding nations, particularly Tanzania, um, and appear to be, or appear to have grown out of, smuggling um, groups that existed in the area already. Uh, so there's some evidence admittedly limited in terms of open source access but there's some evidence that the group has been tied to heroin ivory and ruby smuggling with further evidence suggesting they extract attacks from pre-existing sort of criminal groups smuggling these resources um in that sense we can see that the organization has essentially grown out of a protection racket um that over time has developed more of a uh sort of pseudo social religious conscience as a you know to augment its banner um on top of these factors we're looking at a weakness in the local economy and civil society the group's present message um aside from the uh aside from the increase in religious and islamic islamist uh, ideology also has a strong element of anti-elitism uh, an element of looking after the poor and care for society which appears to be a direct contrast to the government which due to its parlous financial state has rarely managed to actually succeed in delivering any of its promises to the population um frankly this this disenfranchisement is something we see in a lot of areas with active insurgencies um where essentially the state loses any tangible sense of legitimacy to a significant portion of the population um, yet people still have core needs of social welfare protection security and uh, you know, other other elements um, and groups such as in this case al-shabaab or in some areas of say afghanistan the taliban step up in an effort to fill that um, this this absence of protection security again has possibly been highlighted by uh, degradations in the environmental and social factors of their lives from increased industrialization and the lack of benefits fr you know as a result of that exploitation um frankly you can kind of understand how a message of unity and empowerment would be immensely appealing to disenfranchised military defectors unemployed youths criminals and other groups um where the rule of law has failed to protect them So, folks, I mean, as with a lot of these, well, all of these podcasts so far, I think we're raising more questions than we are, than we are answers. But I'm hoping that uh, the previous few minutes have given you a bit of an introduction to what's going on out there, given you a bit of relief from the otherwise unrelentingly grim and COVID-focused um, events going on in the West, uh, and hopefully broadened your horizons a little bit. Um, as far as I see, Mozambique and Cabel Delgado have some interesting situations going on and i will probably be returning to this to keep a see, got general tabs on the situation um so let me know if you liked uh liked this brief introduction let me know if you'd like to hear more about it um and i hope to see you soon uh please give us a like subscribe follow uh depending what platform you're on and any feedback you've got is obviously most appreciated uh well in that case see you soon folks have a good one bye